Chairman, and welcome to this very important session uh, on results of the CAPISA 004 trial. I would like to thank Yeng Rulo from WHO for putting this session together. I'm Gita Ramji from the HRA Prevention Research Unit of the South African Medical Research Council, and I'm absolutely delighted to co-chair this session with uh, Tim Farley from WHO. As someone who has been working on multiple clinical trials of microbicides in South Africa for over a decade, the, these groundbreaking results from CAPRISA 004 means a lot to me personally and, to, and gives hopes to, hope to thousands of women in South Africa and elsewhere so, who have committed to microbicide research in the past and continue to do so in the future. Today, we celebrate the proof of concept of microbicides. Thank you. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the first speaker, Professor Quraysha Abdul Karim. Quraysha is an infectious disease epidemiologist whose current research interests are in understanding the evolving HIV epidemic in South Africa. She's also an associate professor at Mailman School of Public Health and the associate scientific director of CAPRISA. She's also the co-chair of the HIV Prevention uh, Trials Network funded by the NIH. Kuresha. Thank you very much, uh, Geeta, for that very warm introduction. Um, distinguished guests, in particular, I'd like to recognize the Honorable Minister of Health from South Africa, Dr. Aaron Motsuleri. The Honorable Premier of the Province of KwaZulu-Natal, Dr. Zweli Imkizi. <laughs> Dr. Zina Stein. <laughs> and all the gender activists and scientists that have been part of this process of trying to find a method to protect women. It is indeed a great honor and privilege on behalf of the CAPRISA 004 team for Slim and myself to present the data from the effectiveness and safety of vaginal microbicide 1% enough of gel for the prevention of HIV infection in women. If any of you need reminding about the severity of the HIV epidemic, particularly in southern Africa, I'd like to share this slide with you from the prevalence of HIV infection in pregnant women in rural Volunjlela, South Africa, which is one of the clinical sites for this particular trial. By age 16, one in 10 women is already infected with HIV. By age 18, that's one in five. By age 20, that's one in three. By the time these young women are 24, it is one in two. In 1990, Dr. Zina Stein published this paper in the American Journal of Public Health, drawing attention to the need for methods for women. And it was an important catalyst to draw attention to the issue of greater, uh, the, the lack of protection for women and catalyzed a whole generation of studies, around six candidate microbicide trials to date, across 11 trials over a period of 15 years. I'm going to switch now to the CAPRISA 004 trial and share with you why did we choose tenofovir gel. And there were several reasons for that. We had extensive experience with use of tenofovir gel as an effective therapeutic agent. In that context, it had a very good safety profile, and that's important when we want to use a prophylactic agent in uninfected women. It had already been proven for preventing mother-to-child transmission of HIV. The gel formulation is very rapidly absorbed and has a long half-life. 
In addition, it has very low systemic absorption and therefore we expect fewer side effects. There's evidence from monkey studies that it protects against infection with simian immunodeficiency virus. The purpose of the CAPRISA 004 trial was to assess the safety and effectiveness of 1% tenofovir gel. The dosing regimen that was used, um, is the acronym for that is the BAT24 regimen, and it's a coitally related gel use dosing regimen. It comprises the insertion of one gel up to 12 hours before sex, a second gel as soon as possible, but within, six, within 12 hours after sex, and no more than two doses in a 24-hour period based on existing safety data at that point in time. The inspiration for this scientific concept came from the proven HIVNET-012 nevirapine study where infected mothers were given one dose of nevirapine at onset of labor and the infant 72 hours postpartum and that demonstrated a 41% reduction in transmission from infected mothers to infants. In Caprisa 004, the tenofovir gel regimen, we advised women to use the gel 12 hours before sex and as soon as possible after sex, not more than 12 hours and not more than two gels in a 24-hour period. So proof of concept, double-blinded, randomized, placebo-controlled trial. We enrolled high-risk HIV uninfected women reporting two coital acts in the past 30 days. And these are known high-risk populations from pre-trial feasibility studies that we conducted at the two clinical sites. It's an endpoint-driven trial with 92 HIV endpoints. HIV infection serves both as a primary safety and effectiveness endpoint. HIV uninfected people were defined by two negative rapid HIV tests and the endpoint was determined using polymerase chain reaction positivity in two separate blood specimens. All HIV positive endpoints were confirmed using Western blot. And the analysis that I will present to you is based on an intent to treat analysis, except for the adherence analysis. It's a visual of the rural and urban Caprisa clinical sites where this trial was conducted and in terms of ethics and regulatory approvals, informed consent, the process that we utilized for informed consent was informed by community consultation and engagement prior to trial initiation. The informed consent process involved multiple steps. Initially, volunteers were provided with general, a general information session where they were shown the gel, the applicator, they were reminded about key concepts in clinical trials and what obligations and rights of research participants are. If they decided to proceed with, uh, part, with volunteering in the study, we assessed in the, as part of the second step their language choice, literacy levels, and cognitive ability for autonomous decision making. On completion of the, uh, the, uh, in, of the consent process, a comprehension quiz was administered that underscored uh, knowledge of study goal, trial concepts, obligations, and rights as research participants. And if the participants or volunteers met those criteria, we then proceeded with study procedures. This study was conducted under the ethics guidance and, and oversight of the University of KwaZulu-Natal Biomedical Research Ethics Committee, as well as the Protection for Human Subjects Committee of Family Health International. Regulatory oversight was by the South African Medicines Control Council, and we had an internal protocol safety review meeting bi-monthly and an independent data safety and monitoring board uh, that um, looked at the data independent of the study team. Over the course of screening, and we, we, we screened a total of 2,160 women and enrolled and randomized 1,085 women. 
The main reason why, part of, why volunteers were excluded from the study was HIV positivity and other reasons included not meeting eligibility criteria in terms of inclusion and exclusion criteria set for the study. I want to highlight um, these 196 participants who have been excluded and I will talk more about these participants uh, during the, as I present the sensitivity analysis. There were 135 co-enrolled participants. There were 50 participants in another study less than one year ago. We had one participant who was less than 18 years of age, making her ineligible. Then we had eight pre-existing HIV infections, and we had two participants. We had no follow-up data following enrollment. So in total, we had 889 eligibly enrolled participants in the study and 611 at the rural site, 278 at the urban site. So now we'll present data not by site, but in terms of the cohort, but by study arm. So of the 889 enrolled participants, 445 were in the Tanafa Vajal arm, 444 in the placebo arm. 15 were lost to follow up in the Tanofova arm, 8 were terminated early, 10 lost to follow up in the placebo arm, 12 terminated early, 1 died. So for 422 women in the Tanofova arm completed the trial and 421 in the placebo arm, we had an overall retention rate of 94.8% in the study. I want to highlight a couple of characteristics in terms of the comparability of the study arms at baseline in relation to sex selected sexual behavioral characteristics. And what you see is good balance in terms of mean age of sexual debut, uh, number of sexual partners, frequency, and practice of anal sex. And I want to flag the practice of anal sex being very low and pre-trial cohort uh, data identifying this particular characteristic, and because we're testing vaginal use of 1% of a gel, it was one of the criteria we used in terms of site selection. Coital frequency in the past month was 8.6, and uh, about the same reported condom use across both arms. So in terms of assessing the effectiveness of the gel in preventing HIV infection, we had a total of 98 HIV infections, 38 in the Tanofova gel arm, 60 in the placebo arm, translating to an HIV incidence of 5.6 in the Tanofova arm per 100 women years and 9.1 in the placebo arm, yielding an incidence rate ratio of 0.61, p-value 0.017. Another way of looking at this is a 39% lower incidence rate in the Tanafava child group. Okay. So now we look at the data over time. And uh, this was a 30-month study. I want to start by highlighting that after 12 months of gel use, we had 65 endpoints, 50% effectiveness, a p-value of 0 0.007. In other words, we could have stopped the study at this stage and have had a statistically significant result of 50% protection. But as this was an endpoint-driven trial, we continued to our projected 92 endpoints and I'm going to share with you now the data and effectiveness over six months of participation in the study, 12 months, 18, 24, and 30 months. So at six months, we observed a 47% effectiveness, p-value 0.069. After 12 months of follow-up, we had a 50% reduction in HIV infection, p-value 0.007. At 18 months, this was 47%, p-value 0.004. 24 months, 40% effectiveness, p-value 0.013. At 30 months, 39% reduction, 
p-value 0.017. In other words, beyond 12 months, every estimate we have here is statistically significant. So why the diminishing effectiveness over time? And some clues may lie here in terms of how we measured adherence. We measured adherence in multiple ways, and we also asked women to return all the used and unused applicators. Of all of the applicators dispensed, more than 95% were returned either used or unused, providing us with a robust measure to translate use of gel in relation to coital activity. In the blue line, we have gel return gel use, uh, return gel applicators, sorry, in, in HIV uninfected women. In the red line, we have returned gel applicators in women who became infected during the study. And what's of note here is that up to 12 months of study participation, what we saw was more returned applicators from the group um, who, so more, more applicators being used in the group who eventually became positive, but then over time, uh, what we see is a decline indicating lower use of gel beyond 12 months of study participation in comparison to the more constant gel use in those women who were uninfected. <coughs> This is um, a non-ITT analysis, and I said I will present this, and that's why I don't have any p-values um, displayed in this particular table. So, so I want to share with you the impact of adherence on effectiveness of tenof of a gel. So we took the used applicators and used that to correlate two used applicators translates to adherence to the BAT24 message. And if we took women uh, who participated in the study over the study duration, and we found that more than 80% adherence to the BAT24 regimen yielded a 54% protective effect, which was statistically significant. The intermediate adherers, where there was 50 to 80% correlation in relation to BAT24 adherence and, um, and, and coital activity, uh, demonstrated a 38% protection. Amongst low adherers, this was 28%. Okay. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes going through the sensitivity analysis. Uh, and before I do that, I just want to share with you how all of the HIV infections, the num total number of infections in the study was 119. So up to now, I have presented to you the data on the 98 protocol-defined endpoints, and that was the 96 infections during study follow-up and exit, and then we did a safety visit two months after the study exit to try and identify or verify that there wasn't any mast infections potentially in women who were in the tenof of a gel arm. So what we established was that there were two infections in the post-study exit visit uh, that actually were infections at the study exit, so those are the two that I included there. We had one participant who did not meet the protocol definition of HIV uh, infection. She had one PCR, not the second. Then we had the five post-study HIV infections that were truly post-study infections. We had eight infections during the window period. We had two infections in that uh, 185 women who were ineligibly enrolled, uh, two in the window period, five during study, a total of seven. So if we analyze the data, in different ways taking these populations, whether we include them or exclude them. Primary outcome again, 39%, 0.017. If we add the women who didn't have the second PCR, we have an effectiveness of 37%, P.023. If we use the purple protocol population, and there is 85, we have a 41% effectiveness, P.017. 
If we include the ineligibly enrolled women, that will be the 98 infections plus 5, giving us a total of 103 infections, we have 38% effectiveness, p-value 0.015. If we include all of the post-trial infections, 98 plus 5, 103, 41% effectiveness, p-value 0.015. All HIV infections, all 119, didn't matter whether they met the protocol definition, when they happened, we have a 45% effectiveness, p-value 0.003. In short, whichever way you analyze this data, we have a range of protection between 37% to 45%, and each of these analyses yields a statistically significant result. If you look at the impact of tenofovirgel on initial HIV viral load in seroconverters, is an important predictor of disease progression post-infection. What we see is no difference between the tenofovir arm and the placebo arm. All of the data that I've presented today is available in greater detail in Science Express online. That's available at no cost if you want to read more details about this. And I now hand over to Slim to talk about herpes simplex feet, a type 2 virus. Thank you very much, Gracia. Like all good husbands, I follow after her. <laughs> it's my great pleasure to share with you one of the additional analyses that we undertook as part of our ancillary analyses to look at the impact of tenofovir gel on herpes simplex virus type 2 infection. So just by way of introduction, we are well aware that HSV2 infection is ubiquitous and very common. In, it is estimated by WHO that globally about 20% of sexually active adults have HSV2 infection. We know certainly from South African data that 50 to 60% of sexually active adults have HSV2 infection. And certainly within the HIV positive population, we see incredibly high rates of HSV2 at 80 to 90%. We are also aware that those who have HSV2 infection have twice the probability of acquiring HIV. HSV2 is the commonest cause of genital ulcer disease, and it is also largely asymptomatic in women. Most women who are questioned about whether they had or recall symptoms relating to genital uh, infection in those who are HSV2 positive have no such recollection. We also have known therapies for HSV2, but these work by suppressing viral replication. They do not prevent or cure HSV2. With the reason we chose to look at HSV2 for tenofovir was we were aware that tenofovir comes from a common precursor molecule known as HPMPA. This precursor molecule is the fundamental building block of three drugs that are developed by Gilead Sciences. Cydofovir, adofovir, and tenofovir. We know that cydofovir is licensed and used in the treatment of HSV2 infection. Adofovir is used and is licensed for the treatment of hepatitis B and HIV. And viriad, or tenofovir, is also licensed for the use against HIV. So we wanted to see whether the fact that its sister drug had this effect on HSV2, was there any effect on, of HSV2 from tenofovir gel? So the purpose was to look at the impact of quietly related tenofovir gel on HSV2 acquisition in high-risk women in South Africa. This study was done so that we looked at stored samples at the end of the study. So for every woman, we took their enrollment sample and their exit sample and tested it using an HSV2 ELISA that is known to have good sensitivity and specificity in the African context. So you recall that Croatia's presentation, we had 889 illegibly enrolled women. Of those, 454 were HSV2 positive at entry into the study, and we had one missing sample at baseline. So that left us 
with 434 women who were at risk of acquiring HSV2. So now, if you look at this trial that I'm presenting, it is about just under half of the study population that was involved in the HIV trial. Of these 434 women, 208 were in the Tenofovir arm, 226 in the placebo arm. At the end of the study, 202 of the 208 completed the study. We had three missing samples and we had three equivocal results. Just to explain that when you do an ELISA for HSV2, there is a threshold for positivity and there's a threshold for negativity. Unfortunately, you do get occasional samples that fall in between those thresholds, and so we call those equ equivocal. I will present a sensitivity analysis on how we deal with the equivocals. Of the 226 in the placebo arm, we had one missing, one equivocal result, and 224 that completed the study. Here's the study outcome. So in the 202 women who used tenofovir gel, we saw 29 HSV2 infections, giving an incidence rate of 9.9 .9 per 100 women years. In the placebo gel arm of the 224 women who used placebo gel, we saw twice as many HSV2 infections, 58 in all, giving us an, an incidence rate of 20.2 per 100 women years. We saw an incidence rate ratio of 0 0.49 p-value, 0 0.003. In short, 51% protection against HSV2 by tenofovir gel. <laughs> Let me briefly present a sensitivity analysis. So the initial analysis I presented to you with the 87 HSV2 endpoints excludes those with indeterminate or equivocal results. Remember, we had four people with equivocal results. So of the 426 participants, if we analyze these 426 and their 87 infections, we get the 51% protective effect with the p-value of 0.003 that I just presented. If we regard all the equivocals as being HSV2 negative, then we still have 87 infections, but we now have 430 women, and so we have a 52% protective effect, p-value 0.002. If we treat the four indeterminates as if they were all HSV2 positives, that means we now have the 87 plus those four. We now have 91 HSV2 infections, and those 91 infections occur in 430 women, giving us, oops, giving us an effectiveness of 47%, p-value 0.006. If we adjust for every known confounder we could look at within our data set, we get an overall effectiveness adjusted of 47% p-value 0.005. In short, the different approaches we've taken to analyze these data still give us overall an effectiveness that ranges from 47 to 52%. I want to just end off with a short summary of the safety findings. I would be here all day if I had to present the details of the safety data. We looked at tenofovir resistance using standard genotyping assays that are used for patients who are failing therapy. In the women, both in the tenofovir and in the placebo arm, we found no evidence of tenofovir resistance in these women. We found no evidence of K65R, K70E, or the TAMs. We did see some polymorphisms and resistance to nevirapine, but nothing related to tenofovir. So one of the big concerns that has been raised of resistance, we did not find evidence of that within this trial. We saw no increase in the overall rate of side effects. We did, however, see a small increase in mild diarrhea. 17% of women in the tenofovir gel arm reported mild diarrhea, self-limiting with no therapy. 11% in the uh, placebo uh, gel arm, giving us a p-value of 0.015. We saw no renal toxicity, though it must be noted we excluded women with pre-existing renal conditions. We had 54 pregnancies in 53 women. We saw no signals or any safety concerns in that group. The 31 babies born during the study had no congenital abnormalities. We saw no liver side effects or no increase in hepatic flares in the 34 women who had hepatitis B infection within this trial. And lastly, 
when we looked at trends for condom use over the period of the study, we saw no deterioration in condom use. We also asked women at the end of the study if they knew which gel they were on, and about 19.5% said that they thought they were on Tenofovir gel. When we looked at the actual uh, allocation, exactly 50% of them were actually on placebo, so we know the blinding work. But in those group of women who thought they were getting tenofovir gel, we looked at whether they showed any evidence of deteriorating use of existing proven technologies for prevention, like condom use, partner uh, uh, change rates. We saw no evidence of that. So in summary, the Capriso for findings. We show no substantive safety concerns, no tenofovir resistance. We found safety in the hepatitis B infected women, and we saw no evidence of risk compensation or behavioral disinhibition. We've shown a 51% reduction in HSV2. We've shown a 39% protection against HIV overall and a 50% protection in HIV after one year of tenofovir gel use. In women with high adherence, we show 54% effectiveness. I want to conclude with just four points. First, we all recognize and understand the importance of women, and particular young women, bearing the brunt of the HIV epidemic in Africa. Tenofovir gel potentially adds a new approach to HIV prevention as the first that can be used and controlled by women. It can help empower women to take control of their own risk of HIV infection. We take the view that Caprisa O4 study is the first step Additional studies are urgently needed to confirm and indeed to extend the findings of this trial, both for safety and effectiveness. Once confirmed and implemented, tenofovir gel has the potential to alter the course of the HIV epidemic. Mathematical models show and provide estimates that if we could implement tenofovir gel in a way similar to the way in which we did it in the trial, we could prevent 1.3 million new HIV infections and over 800,000 deaths over the next 20 years in South Africa alone. I'd like to end off with an acknowledgement to our funders, USAID and the South African Department of Science and Technology for their very generous support. To the Minister of Health, I want to say a big thank you. And particularly, I want to thank our Premier of our province, William Kesey, who really was the inspiration, together with his wife, for much of our work. And indeed, he served on the Caprisa Scientific Advisory Board when we made the decision to proceed with the study. My thanks to Conrad and to Gilead Sciences for providing the gel and for all their wonderful support, and to FHI for their incredible support and continued technical assistance. There are many, many people involved in a study of this magnitude. And you can imagine the infrastructure that it takes and all the contributors to that. But really, the, the heroes of this study are not the two of us. We are merely the messengers. It is the big research team that undertook this study. But most importantly, this study is really there because of the dedication and commitment to the study participants who made this possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know you would like to keep on standing, but in the interest of time, we have to continue. Um, I'd like to thank Slim and Koresha for the wonderful and very comprehensive presentation of the results. We have time for three questions on just clarification, and later we'll have some time for discussion. So we'll take three questions all at once, and then uh, Slim or Koresha will address them. And please introduce yourself. Mike isn't working. Oh, yes, it is. Uh, Gus Cairns, AIDS map. 
Was there an overlap between the women who zero converted to HSV2 and the ones who zero converted to HIV? Is there a reinforcement thing going on here? Okay, uh, second question. Anita Ordenser, South yeah. Africa, with Cape Department of Health. Um, just one around condoms. Were women encouraged to use condoms or not during this trial? And then do, is there a split between rural and urban in terms of um, placebo versus tenofovir? And then, of course, the results in terms of HIV positivity as well in the same split versus rural and, 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 and urban. And then just to ask around biases, um, do, do you know what split of women were married versus multiple and single partners? And then also the age ranges would be interesting to know. <laughs> That's a lot of questions. <laughs> but it, I mean, that is just, sorry, if I missed anything, but... Thank yeah, you. We'll thank take you. the last question. Was there any information, artist Mo from UCLA, was there any information on the partners of the women and whether or not they understood whether or not they're, they're, the women were on placebo versus real drug? Okay, Slim or Croatia? Shall I take the first one? So let me answer Gus's question. So we looked at that issue in great detail. You must remember that the effect of tenofovir gel on HIV is independent of its effect on HSV2. In other words, in those women who are HSV2 positive, we see the protective effect of tenofovir gel. In those women who are HSV2 negative, similarly, we see the protective effect of tenofovir gel. If we adjust for HSV2 status, the effectiveness of tenofovir gel remains 38% statistically significant. If we look at the, the, the real question I think Gus is asking is in those 87 women who became HSV2 infection, what effect did we see of HIV incidence in that group? The challenge is that those numbers are too small. We have a very small number of infections, and so you can't really analyze that group. So all we can do is adjust for it and show that it does not account HSV2 does not account for the, H, the tenofovir effect on HIV. We looked at the reverse. So does HIV influence the effect of tenofovir on HSV2? That analysis shows us at this point we have, because we have a limited number of HIV positive individuals, remember that we don't enroll HIV positive individuals. And if we look at the HIV negative individuals and those who became infected, we see no interaction term. So in other words, when you look at tenofovir, it has two independent mechanisms. One, as an antiretroviral drug impacting directly on HIV. Secondly, as a drug that's impacting on HSV2, thereby in the long term will lower the overall prevalence of HSV2 and therefore lead to a lower risk of HIV in the long term. Our study was not designed to assess that. In the interest of time, I didn't provide detailed information on study procedures that were followed in the study. Each woman enrolled in the study had a monthly visit. During that monthly visit, she had pregnancy testing, HIV testing. And because this is a safety study of an experimental drug, we also had clinical assessments. Because it was an experimental drug and we didn't know whether it worked, Every month, women received very intensive and independent counseling on HIV risk reduction. They were provided with condoms, both male and female, and they were advised each month, we don't know whether this works, please use a condom. So this could partially also explain some of the diminishing effect that we saw with time in the study. This study was not powered for analysis by site. But we do have balance in both sides in terms of randomization. And overall, we had a balance and comparability between the sites in terms of uh, the arms a woman we randomized to. Um, there was a question around acceptability and partner acceptability. We uh, administered a very detailed uh, questionnaire at study exit to try and get some objective uh, uh, feedback on um, acceptability and influences uh, of gel use, uh, both in terms of the woman, the dosing strategy, partner, community, and peer norms. So just in terms of partners, about 68% of the women reported the partner being aware that she used a condom. We had uh, 
sorry, the Chiyus, the Chao, and um, we didn't have partners objecting uh, to the use of gel, uh, and uh, there's lots of data around that that we can share perhaps in the symposium later. And perhaps just to make the point that if you look at the science paper, there's a web, there's an email address. If you have questions on the paper or any of the data we presented, please feel free to email us and we'd be happy to respond. Uh, thank you very much, Slim and Karisha. I'm sorry that we have to cut the discussion short, but we have another very important presentation uh, from uh, Angela Kashuba. Uh, Angela is Associate Professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the Director of the UNC Center for AIDS Research Clinical Pharmacology and Analytical Chemistry Corps. Her research focus is in antiretroviral pharmacology as it applies to prevention of HIV transmission, and she will be telling us about this aspect of the results uh, of the Caprisa 004 trial. Angela, over to you. Thank you very much. It is my honor and privilege to be presenting the results of this study for the Caprisa 004 study team. The objectives of this pharmacology study were to quantify tenofovir concentrations in blood, in cervical vaginal fluid, and in vaginal and cervical tissue to, first of all, determine if tenofovir exposure can predict HIV seroconversion, and to determine what the variability was in drug exposure with coitally dependent dosing. Also, because it's the intracellular tenofovir diphosphate that is the active form of the drug, we wanted to quantify this in vaginal and cervical tissue uh, to determine the extent of exposure and also to determine whether there was a predictable relationship between tenofovir and its diphosphate in these tissues. And finally, because of the results of the HSV2 analysis, we wanted to determine if tenofovir cervical vaginal fluid concentrations can predict HSV2 seroconversion. Here are the number of subjects and samples analyzed for the HIV infection analysis. Out of the 98 women who were infected, we obtained uh, samples from 37 women who were on the tenofovir gel and from 13 women on placebo. In the women who were uninfected, we received samples from 24 who were on the tenofovir gel and 16 who were on placebo. For the HSV2 analysis, in the women who were infected with HIV and those who were using tenofovir gel, we received samples from five who became HSV2 positive and six who remained HSV2 negative. In those women who were not infected with HIV but using the gel, we received samples from 12 women who became HSV2 positive and 74 who remained HSV2 negative. All samples were analyzed by sensitive LC-MSMS methods. These methods quantified simultaneously tenofovir and tenofovir diphosphate using deuterated internal standards. The lower limit of quantitation for tenofovir in plasma was 0.25 nanograms per mil. In cervical vaginal fluid, it was 2 nanograms per mil, and in tissue, it was 1 nanogram per biopsy. The lower limit of quantitation for tenofovir diphosphate was 5 femtomoles uh, per biopsy. These methods were very accurate and very precise. For the pharmacokinetic analysis, samples that were below our limit of quantitation but were still detected, they were set to 50%, the lower limit of quantitation of the assay. And then samples that were below the limit of detection, where we saw no drug at all, they were set to zero nanograms per mil. And all of the data are reported as median and range. Here are the results for blood plasma. For women on tenofovir gel, the uh, concentrations can be seen on the left-hand portion of the slide in these two columns, and for placebo in this column. Tenofovir concentrations on the y-axis range here from zero to one nanogram per mil. For those women who were on the gel and became HIV positive, the median concentration was zero, with a range of zero to 0 0.1. And for those who remained HIV negative, the median concentration was 0 0.1, with a range of zero to 0 0.8. There were no women on placebo who had detectable tenofovir in their plasma. These low concentrations are in keeping with the observations uh, for adverse events, for HIV RNA, and for resistance. Evaluated another way, the proportion of women who had detectable concentrations in their plasma and became HIV positive was 12%, and those who remained HIV negative was 50%. 
Now these samples were obtained a median of four to six days after the last dose of gel. So these concentrations uh, might seem a bit high for uh, uh, measuring them between uh, four and six days after gel, but they're in keeping with the uh, dwell time of tenofovir and cervicovaginal fluid. This is the analysis that we performed on an additional 250 samples from 172 highly adherent women in 004 who remained HIV negative. And the composite profiles are here. And whether you look at median, uh, or mean value in pink, excuse me, or median value in green, you see a half-life of about two days. And over the first few days after dosing, most of the concentrations are above 1,000 nanograms per mil. Here's the CVF uh, analysis for tenofovir concentrations. In the women on tenofovir gel who became HIV positive, their median concentration was a nanogram per mil, and it ranged from zero to 300,000. In HIV negative women, the median concentration was 520, and it ranged from zero to 1.3 million. And this is about the concentration of the gel itself. In placebo, most of the women did not have detectable cervicovaginal fluid concentrations, except for two which were approximately uh, four nanograms per mil. And in one of these women, we do have data on when she instilled the gel, and it was two days before. So based on the slide that I previously showed you, it is highly unlikely that this woman was actually using tenofovir gel. It could be more likely that this woman had a partner who was on uh, tenofovir because we've previously seen that tenofovir concentrates in seminal fluid. But this is strictly speculation, and we are investigating, investigating these women more carefully to understand if this was a consistent exposure. Uh, evaluated differently, the proportion of women with detectable concentrations in cervicovaginal fluid for those who became HIV positive was 45% versus 96% for those who remained HIV negative. And these samples were obtained a median of four to five days after uh, gel use, and these concentrations are in keeping with the previous slide that I showed you. Now, we did an analysis just on these concentrations here of women who were on tenofovir gel who became HIV positive and who remained HIV negative. This is the relationship that we see. On the y-axis is percent infected, and on the x-axis is concentration of tenofovir and cervicovaginal fluid. And we have grouped these women according to their uh, log concentrations. Total number of women can be seen in the shaded bar, and the number of infected women in each of these groups can be seen below. And although the numbers get small, the higher the concentration in cervicovaginal fluid, you can see a fairly compelling relationship between cervicovaginal fluid concentrations and percent infected. In the women who became infected, we also obtained tenofovir uh, diphosphate and tenofovir concentrations in cervical and vaginal tissue biopsies. And on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see tenofovir concentration on the x-axis and tenofovir diphosphate on the y-axis. And whether you look at vaginal tissue in pink or cervical tissue in green, you can see a fairly linear relationship between the two. And we think this is important because it's the first time that anyone has evaluated what the extracellular concentrations look like relative to the intracellular concentrations. And now that we have this relationship, we can more easily calculate dosing once we know what the target concentration is for efficacy, for protection. And if you compare vaginal tissue concentrations in this graph on the x-axis to cervical tissue concentrations on the y, whether you look at tenofovir in the light blue or tenofovir diphosphate in the darker blue, we also see a linear relationship between the two. And this becomes important because this suggests that wherever you sample in the female genital tract, you can get an understanding of what the entire genital tract is seeing. And this will be helpful for mucosal PK studies moving forward in the future. And finally, here's the correlation between tenofovir cervicovaginal fluid concentrations and HSV2 infection. Again, percent infected with HSV2 is on the y-axis and tenofovir concentration is on the x-axis. Total number of women is in the shaded bar and number infected is below. And you can also see a relationship between lower percent infected with HSV2 and increasing concentrations of tenofovir. 
Now, in early development, tenofovir was thought not to be potent against, against HSV2 because of its in vitro EC50 of 240 micromolar or 10,000 nanograms per mil. This concentration is difficult to achieve uh, taking a drug orally, but is very easy to achieve taking a drug topically. And if we compare those women who had concentrations less than 10,000 nanograms per mil to those that had concentrations greater than 10,000 nanograms per mil, you can see 24% infection in, the, uh, in this group and 6% infection in this group, and this was statistically significant. So in summary, in women using tenofovir gel, uh, they had very low systemic exposure, and that was also associated with the limited AEs that were seen, no attenuation of HIV replication, and no plasma HIV resistance. More HIV-negative women had detectable blood plasma concentrations at 50% versus 12%, and this is likely a surrogate for adherence. Tenofovir concentrations in cervicovaginal fluid ranged from 0 to 1.3 million. More HIV-negative women had detectable CVF concentrations at 96% compared to 45%. And higher cervicovaginal fluid concentrations of tenofovir were associated with uh, lower HIV seroconversion and lower HSV2 seroconversion. So taken together, I think these data suggest that CVF concentrations are a promising marker for adherence and also a potential means to determine target concentrations of protection. And finally, in cervical and vaginal tissues, there was a linear relationship within and between tenofovir and tenofovir diphosphate, which will definitely help inform sampling strategies for future trials. And I'd like in particular to thank the sincere generosity of the women in 004 who donated their samples, the extraordinary efforts the 004 study team went to collecting these samples, and also two individuals in the UNC Center for AIDS Research, Clinical Pharmacology and Analytical Chemistry Corps, Eric Kraft and Nicole White, who had the monumental task of developing these very complex analytical methods and perfecting them uh, over the past two years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela, for, the, for those uh, very interesting data. And I must say I'm absolutely fascinated by the uh, precision and the quality of the, uh, of the analytical chemistry. Uh, we have time for just a few questions uh, of a technical nature to Angela, questions for clarification. If you'd like to come to the microphones and identify yourself, please. Microphone number four. Hi. Um, Mark Milano from New York. It seems that the real barrier to adherence in the trial was the requirement to use the gel 12 hours before sex pretty difficult to determine if you're going to have sex 12 hours from now or not. Did you look at whether you can achieve an acceptable co uh, concentration with a lower time? Are there studies planned to see if you can apply the gel an hour or half hour before sex and still achieve a concentration that's going to be effective? That seems to be a pretty critical need if this gel is going to be used in the future. Very good. Okay, I think we have another question. Do we have another question? Anyone else? So, that's good. And, uh, Angela, please, would you like to uh, address that question? Sure. So, the, um, so first of all, the study uh, instructed women to take the gel within 12 hours, so it didn't have to be 12 hours before. It could have potentially been right before. But your point is well taken. How long does it take the cells within the mucosal tissue to phosphorylate tenofovir to an extent that's protective? And we actually don't have those data yet. So thank you very much. Um, in order to introduce a more general discussion and put this in context, uh, I'd like to invite Sheena McCormack, uh, who is a clinical epidemiologist coordinating HIV prevention trials at the Medical Research Council Clinical Trials Unit, uh, working currently on vaccine trials uh, and microbicide trials. She was the co-PI of the MDT program, uh, MDP301 trial, uh, that looked at the safety and effectiveness of PRO2000. Uh, and Sheena will introduce some of the discussion uh, some of the context uh, of, uh, of the trial, and then I hope we can have just a few minutes for a more general discussion. Sheena, over to you. And Tim, four minutes, we're saying. Four minutes. <laughs> All right, four minutes. So thank you very much to the organizing uh, committee for the opportunity to speak on this very auspicious um, occasion. And I'm going to go straight to a table that's adapted from 
a paper that Nancy Paley and Judy Wasserheit and co-authors published in AIDS earlier this year, and I'd strongly recommend that you uh, read that paper because it gives you a more thorough review than I can give you today. But you'll see in the column down the side here the categories of the different interventions that have been gone into randomized controlled trials to see if we could prevent um, transmission horizontal transmission. This doesn't include the mother to child uh, transmission. And you'll see here a very small number of trials for which we've had a statistically significant benefit. The authors go into the details of why we have no effect here. It's not always no evidence of benefit, but overall the picture is a disappointing one. So yes, it is exciting, and you've all felt that uh, in the room today. It is proof of concept for ARV prophylaxis, as well as proof of concept for microbicides, and actually, as Slim alluded to, proof of concept for prevention of HSV2 as well. But is it sufficient evidence to roll it out globally? Well, let's have a look at the uh, estimates and the confidence intervals for those positive uh, results. And along the bottom here of the chart, 0 to 100, just to explain that 100% means that there was no infection, no seroconversions in the intervention group, and that there were approximately the expected number of seroconversions in your placebo group, what you expected when you planned your study uh, sample. The 0% means that the numbers in both groups are approximately the same. So I'll go straight to the three circumcision trials, which are sitting here in the middle. And you'll see there that all of them are reporting over a 50% uh, uh, protection. So that means, say, if there are 50 infections in the intervention group, you've got 25 uh, in the placebo group, approximately, a 50% reduction. And importantly, the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval, which is down here at the end of the line, that line is telling you approximately where your study thinks the true benefit is. And the lower bound of that line is well clear of no benefit. And it's really suggesting a very important benefit. So it's no surprise that circumcision uh, efforts are being made to roll out uh, circumcision. Here we have the vaccine trial, which I have to say did produce a warm glow in the vaccine uh, research arena. But I think with Caprice, we're talking a little bit more about a hot flush. <laughs> because we're just a little bit further clear of chance being the possible explanation. And it makes a lot of sense. You've got the greater protection that you see in the more adherent users. You've got that protection against HSV2 the consistency that you saw against across the analyses over time and over whether or not you included um, uh, all the women who uh, had seroconverted in the co-enrolment uh, uh, group, etc. It's also very consistent with the fact that ARVs do very effectively prevent mother-to-child uh, transmission. The data that Angela has shown you, and also from other studies that Conrad Jill Schwartz has uh, produced, showing this very high level of drug in the genital tissues, that correlation with the clinical data that Angela showed you, it's very compelling. And then the intermittent McCart challenge uh, studies that CDC have run, Walid and, and the group there, are also very supportive, particularly because they have PK2, which correlates with the protection in the McCart model. But the limitations are that lower bound around the 95% confidence interval, the p-value. It is not the strength of evidence of two trials, which is what the regulators want to license a new modality. And remember that vaginal microbicides using ARV for vaginal use, it is a new licensing indication. Uh, it's not like the oral drugs, which are already at least licensed and available. And it is, of course, a single trial population. So you need to know what's in the pipeline, and you can see here if you scan down, we've got five effectiveness trials that are going to report, IPRAX quite soon. Oral, uh, where's that arrow gone? There we go. Oral, 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 oral. <laughs> They're all tenofovir-based regimes, either alone or in combination with FTC, Truvada. Daily, 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 daily. Uh, but they are in very diverse populations, couples, MSM, IDU, uh, women, and they are global. 
Thailand, we've got Kenya, Uganda, Sub-Saharan Africa as well uh, as five countries in several countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, including South Africa. But for vaginal microbicides, we have MTN003, the voice trial only, that's looking at tenofovir, same concentration as Caprisa, and daily. So I would say what is missing, and it relates to the question that we've just heard addressed to Angela, is effectiveness or otherwise of intermittent vaginal dosing, particularly giving it perhaps before sex, and if you don't manage to give it before, giving it after. Also importantly, how long can those intervals be between testing? It's not practical to roll out something where you're testing people every four weeks for pregnancy and HIV. How long can those intervals be safely uh, without an unacceptable level of resistance? And of course, rectal safety and rectal effectiveness. So uh, what else is missing? I'm going to skip over those, but as you already alluded to the, to the PK, excited, definitely yes, ready to roll out. I think you've already heard this from the Caprisa team, not quite there yet. It is proof of concept on three counts. The ARV is prophylaxis, microbicides is a routed delivery, and we know from all the trials that have been before how much women and their partners actually like these products, and proof of concept of protection against HSV2. So the window for placebo-controlled trials is definitely open at the moment, but it could be closing. And prioritizing those questions is really urgent. That's a researcher perspective, because I guess that's what I am. But you can't ignore, because I am also a doctor, the challenge of delivering effective treatment to those that need it in resource-limited settings. We've heard a lot of that today uh, over this conference, and I'm sure we're going to hear more. It is a challenge that we have to face. Managing the risk of resistance, whether it comes from non-adherence to treatment regimens or PrEP monotherapy, because people are seroconverting without realizing it whilst being exposed to a single drug, is going to determine the shape of the epidemic over the next two decades. And consultation is going to be absolutely key to managing that risk. But we can and must manage that risk. The consultation has to go on with communities, ethics committees and governments will be critical to the success of this. So it's a step in the right direction, undoubtedly, particularly for women, particularly for women, uh, where the need is so great. A step in the right direction, but it is a step and a path. I want to thank the Caprisa team for giving us that step, but I hope in the discussion we're going to hear from the communities what their priorities are. So thank you very much. Sheena, thank you, thank you very much for, for putting this result in a broader context and possibly bringing some of the enthusiasm that we saw today, quite rightly, uh, uh, d down to the realities of where we go next. Before opening for the general discussion, I would like to invite the Honourable Minister of Health, the Honourable Aaron Mutsuledi, to say uh, just a few words um, uh, uh, about the trial and what he sees as the implications uh, from his perspective. Uh, the Honourable Minister. <coughs> Program director, indeed, a step in the right direction. On behalf of the Department of Health of the Republic of South Africa and the government of the Republic, I used to say that we are very, very encouraged because it is definitely promising. For the first time, we are now dealing with the missing link in the fight against HIV AIDS, especially the prevention part. As we know, young women in their reproductive years bear the brunt of the disease more than any other group in the population. And up to so far, in our arsenal, we have been having weapons which are useful to males only. We, had, we have a male condom used only when the man is willing. Many women don't have any say in that. We have the female condom 
used again only when the man is prepared to accept it. Many young women don't have a say in that. We have got massive medical male circumcision, which, for instance, is being rolled out in South Africa. Against, again, it is young men who are going to be protected. For the first time, we are now dealing with the missing link, a weapon for young women. This might be the beginning of the answer to the questions we've been asking for ages. For using this gel 12 hours before and 12 hours after, within this period of 12 hours, means that regardless of the whims of the men, young women will now take their lives into their own hands. As a Department of Health in the Republic of South Africa, we shall do everything in our power to take this matter forward and to do whatever is possible to make sure that our country, our continent, and the rest of the world benefits from the results of this very, very exciting and promising study. Anything Anything in the preventional arsenal, prevention against HIV AIDS, is to be keenly welcomed by all of us. So for this reason, I want to take this opportunity to thank Cabrisa, Professor Salim Abdul Karim was actually my classmate <laughs> at university, so I'm also taking personal victory. <laughs> I used to also take this opportunity to thank the Premier of KZN, Kazun Natal Province the biggest province in South Africa in terms of population, where the HIV prevalence is the highest, where this study is taking place, we have heard how he has been supporting the team. Him and the king of KZ, KwaZulu Natal, also launched the massive medical male circumcision. And by the way, Dr. Zuelim Kisa was also our schoolmate, so there is some form of relationship here ranging over 30 years. It's only that he was at, la at last ahead of the two of us. <laughs> I also used to take this opportunity to thank our sister department in South Africa, the Department of Science and Technology, for being co-sponsors of this study. I also used to thank the U.S. government. The sponsorship through USAID has been very important to us. And I wish to thank all the young women who participate in these studies. They are our heroes. What is left is for those of us in positions of authority to make sure that everything is taken forward and to make everything possible. I thank you. Minister, thank you very much for those, for, those, uh, for those remarks and for putting this trial in a more personal context and in the context of all your old school friends. Um, the, I, unfortunately, we do have to close this session and we have run out of time, so we're not going to be able to have a discussion now. I apologize, but 
do not feel disappointed. There is another session this evening which will take place uh, at 6.30, which is a session organized by the Global Campaign for Microbicides. When those of you who have questions, and I do hope that this evening we will be able to have a more general discussion, not just on the technical issues, do come to that session. It is at 6.30 p.m. and it will be in mini room 10, uh, just the other side uh, of the building. Please also note that there was a session planned for later this evening at 8.30 p.m. In the, in the Hilton Hotel, uh, but that session has been cancelled and will be rolled in with the uh, Global Campaign satellite again at 6.30 p.m. tonight uh, in Mini Room 10. Now, just a few uh, summary remarks. I think we have heard absolutely fantastic and landmark results. Uh, my colleague Gita just reminded me that she and I started out together uh, a long time ago, but 10 years ago to the day at the Durban AIDS conference, we heard the results of the Noxonal 9 trial, which was the first uh, potential microbicide that went into a phase 3 trial. It did not work. We've had a whole series of products that did not work, and this